You may be seated. Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the gates. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. It may seem a bit odd that we have a feast day to St. Mary Magdalene. If you didn't already know it, all the feast days are noted at the front of the hymnal. In the church year section, it's XI if you ever want to look at it. And of all the feasts and festivals that we celebrate, apart from those feasts dedicated to the mother of our Lord, St. Mary, uh, which she gets a few, the only other feast that recognizes a woman is this day, St. Mary Magdalene. The rest are apostles, for the most part, or martyrs. But if you turn the page, on the next day you have what we like to call commemorations. This is called the sanctoral calendar, at least used to be called. And there you'll find a great um, deal of women who don't get a feast day, but get recognized throughout the year. And I think it's appropriate for us to have this feast to Mary Magdalene so that we don't forget the role that she, of course, has in the Easter account. Now we have Easter in July, just like we had Christmas in July a few weeks ago. But not only that, because, but because she is a representative of, of the faithful church who cares for her Lord and is greatly distressed when it seems that his death has been permanent. Why would she be so distressed about the death of Jesus? Not just because he was Rabboni, as she said, teacher, but Jesus had brought her healing. He had, had delivered her uh, from death. But that would only hold true if Jesus himself conquered death. This is why she's so distressed on that Easter morning. If he is dead, then we all die. Die just not temporally, but eternally. And so she is quite stricken with grief, and she comes to the tomb early to assist in the anointing of the Lord's body. Of course, finding the tomb empty, she runs to the disciples. And thus she has earned a title, as I mentioned before we began, the apostle to the apostles, the sent one to the sent ones. She was sent, of course, by the angels. And then they come, and they see the two at the the one at the head and one at the foot. Again, overwhelmed, she says, they've taken away my Lord and I don't know where they've laid him. And what's really remarkable, and you've heard me preach on this, I suppose, on Easter, is that when she turns around, she sees Jesus but does not recognize him but supposes him to be the gardener. Of course, John wants you to remember, the evangelist, Another time that Jesus was in a garden. You might think the Garden of Gethsemane, but go a little bit farther back. Well, rather go back all the way to the beginning. When God the Father spoke the word, his Son, in whom all things were made and in whom all things have their being. And then God the Son walked amongst Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, conversing with them and pointing out all that he had made, calling it all very good. So at the beginning of the story, if you like, the beginning of the Bible is a story about a gardener and those whom he have created, the heavens, the earth, everything therein, the stars, the planets, the birds, and the beasts of the field, the sea creatures, and of course, the capstone is man. Or you might rather say, man and woman. Because you notice, as Genesis 2 records, that it was not good for man, Adam, to be alone, and so he made a helper fit for him. There is no such thing as man apart from woman. Of course, no, no man will, can acknowledge that he came simply out of the ground like Adam, but we all come from woman, don't we? 
And so it has been from the beginning. Mankind has included both male and female. Of course, now in this world, we're a little bit confused about male and female. People identify it as something different than that. Of course, there's a whole spectrum now of alphabet letters that you can use, that you can choose, and maybe an appropriate color or a sign to attach to that. And then, of course, there are those who will intentionally mutilate their bodies to ignore or to deny how God has made them. And I think that's the key, is that God has made you, along with all creatures. God is not only the gardener, but he is the creator of the garden, maker of you. And by recognizing that, it actually aids in our understanding of how we can rightly understand the roles given to us in this world, but also especially in this church, in every Christian church. Along with the denial of the sex roles as, well, I would suggest as God has actually written it into nature, male and female, and the particularity of each, the same ideas have corrupted our understanding of, well, our roles in the church. So, especially for a conservative denomination like ours, that is conserving the Word of God and adhering to what God's Word says, many will look at us and not just be offended by the way that we affirm male and female, but even further, how we affirm the particular particular roles, the particularity of male and female as God gives it in the church. This is even more offensive than male and female being written into the very chromosomal nature of every person. But even more offensive is that within the church then, God also has given particular roles to male and female. I preached on this a few weeks ago uh, when it came to the role of fathers in being the spiritual caretakers of their home. Now, of course, fathers, husbands and fathers, are responsible for providing for their, their spouse and their children, defending them from what seeks to hurt and harm them. But God also has, from days of old, and from Adam, really, until present, given to the head of the household, the father, to instruct not only his wife, but his children, in God's word. Now, that's offensive. That's maybe even offensive to some Christians, saying, well, anybody can teach God's Word. Well, maybe that's true in, in an earthly sense, and maybe it's even true that's, that the mother is a more adept scholar of God's Word than, than the father. But it doesn't matter. The question is not who is more skilled and who's more adept at a job. The question is, who has God given to do that job? If it were about skill or ability, then uh, we would know right from the beginning um, that men are not suitable to be the heads of the household and to teach the faith. Because when Eve was tempted by the serpent with false words, not God's word, false words, what did Adam do but stand there dumbfounded, mute, failing to rebuke the servant and to forgive his wife? So from the beginning, men have fallen short of the glory of God in that particular role that has been given to them, the head of the household, the house fodder, as Luther says it in the catechism, should teach his children. But it doesn't matter because that's who God has given it to. What does matter is that where the father falls short, that he study God's word, maybe open the small catechism and learn it again, or even better, the large catechism, which was given to him for that role, study the scriptures daily, and start just doing a better job, living daily, confessing their weakness and shortcoming, and pleading to the Lord for forgiveness. And so also then, it has been given to women, very particular roles. And we heard some of them articulated by Solomon in Proverbs 31, talking about the virtuous wife, the heart of her husband, safely trusts her. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She cares for the clothing needs with the wool and flax, 
She brings food from even afar. She provides that food for our household and portions for those who work under her, her maidservants. She plants the vineyard. She works even all night with her lamp not going out at the spindle. She helps care for the poor and the needy amongst them. She's not afraid of snow for her household, for she clothes them in scarlet so they do not get lost. She upholds her husband so that he can be known in the gates sitting among the elders. And then, of course, there were many other things that she mentioned, that were mentioned of her. Now, Proverbs 31, of course, is a little intimidating for women. I don't know about you, but working nonstop, day in and day out, and doing what sounds to be, seems to be a pretty incredible job as a wife. Well, again, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and even women in this role that Solomon upholds. But as with the man, so with the wife. It doesn't matter. You confess your sins, you plead to the Lord for forgiveness, and then you go back to your work and seek to do better. Again, within the church, there are specific roles given, and this is where Mary Magdalene might make us a little confused. Calling her the apostle of the apostle, did the Lord truly send her to the nations? No, that's the role that he gives to his 11, going on 12, maybe even 13, as we've talked about before. Those who had studied under him for three years. But here on this occasion, he does give to her this particular role to go to announce to the others that he has risen and that he will meet them in Galilee. Is it extraordinary? Sure. Is she going to continue to go forth as an apostle with the rest? Likely not. But he did give her this on that day and for that reason. And it's quite beautiful because remember, before the garden, or in the garden, there was a promise made by, by the Lord. It was a curse against the serpent and a promise given to the man and woman, especially to the woman, of the offspring that would crush the serpent's head. That work has been accomplished on that Easter morning. And so it's appropriate again, as a woman first heard the promise, that a woman would hear the promise fulfilled and go and announce it to the others. So he chose this lowly woman on whom he had cast out seven demons to go and announce to his church that he had risen from the dead and had defeated sin, death, and devil. And that's what we might want to recognize even more strongly, is that Mary Magdalene, well, she is a picture of the church who receives the word of Jesus and goes where he tells her, does what he says. Just as at the wedding at Cana, Mary, Magdal or Mary the mother of Jesus says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. That Mary is an icon of a faithful receiving church, male and female, both together, who receives the word from Jesus listens to it with a willing heart, and then in faith does what he says. Whether we like it, whether we understand it, whether the specific roles and duties are given as they are given in the scriptures makes sense to us, rather than looking at qualifications and earthly strength or even things like wealth or power, that instead we would look to the word of Jesus to instruct us as to what we should be about. So she is a wonderful example of a receiving church, a church that receives God's word and listens with a cheerful heart and does what he says. And so, when he says, go to all nations preaching the gospel, that's what his church does. When he says, go forth preaching the gospel and baptizing in his name, that's what we do. Even though it seems to us to be even a little bit absurd to sprinkle some water on someone and say a few words and then say that that somehow delivers them from death eternally and makes them a child of God, adoption, and washes away all sins now and forever. And yet that's what Jesus says it does, and so we take him at his word. And even tonight, that we go to the altar, we'll kneel and receive under bread and wine, Christ's body and blood, as he says, and as he instructs us to do, 
Not necessarily because we understand it or because um, it looks all that impressive or it has earthly glory, but rather simply because he promises and he keeps his promises, just as he did for Eve in the garden, fulfilled in the son of Mary and revealed to Mary Magdalene on Easter Day. So he reveals to us that he's promised to forgive us, and he does so. Sometimes in ways that don't seem all that impressive or maybe even the way that we would do it, but rather it is precisely the way he has instituted it for us and for our benefit. Unless we don't take him at his word, he gives us a preacher, he gives us his word so that we hear that word and his Holy Spirit works faith in our hearts so that once not trusting, we become trusting again and receive the gifts that he desires to give. And so he calls you by name, maybe not Mary, but your given name, or how about this name, Christian, to which you say, Rabboni, teacher, give me your word. In Jesus' name, amen.